um, in this book of Titus. Titus is, you're going to see very similar in a lot of ways to 1 Timothy. This is another location of Paul setting up a church. And instead of Timothy being the one he's trained up to, to do this, it's Titus. So um, you will see some similarities, which is why I think we're going to go a little bit quicker through some of this material, because I want to really spend our time on, on newer stuff. So let's pray and get going. Our Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, Lord, and just lifting up your word, Lord, lifting up your name, seeing what you've inspired, Lord, to be written for all the ages to know. And so, Lord, we're here and we're gathered uh, to be very serious-minded about your word and, and to be open, Lord, to the teachings that have changed the world more and better than any other teachings have ever done. We're grateful that you're our God, and we uh, want to honor your son who died on a cross for us tonight. So be lifted up, Lord. Make this hour eternally significant in all of our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so Titus was a Gentile believer who was of great service to Paul. He served as Paul's living proof that circumcision was not necessary for salvation. You see in Galatians chapter 2, <coughs> Galatians chapter 2, verse 3, uh, Paul said, Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So he's saying, I had this Greek man with me and I did not compel him to be circumcised because he's going to serve as my living witness that circumcision no longer is necessary for you to be in covenant with God. Now, that strikes your ears differently than it would a first century person. Circumcision was central for the Jewish person in the first century. So one of Paul's biggest pushes was to say that circumcision is now a circumcision of the heart, meaning a cutting of the flesh of the heart, the part of the flesh that desires sin. It's cutting that out now. And you're saved by grace through faith alone. <coughs> and circumcision does not play a part in that. Well, Timothy, who was born to a Jewish mother and a Greek father, Paul had him to be circumcised to there because as Timothy traveled with him, it was to keep peace with the Jews that they were trying to convert. Titus served as an example on the other end, not going to be circumcised to show that it's not necessary and that Paul was serious when he said, Titus is just as welcome in the faith as Timothy, the circumcised and the uncircumcised. So it was kind of the, Titus and Timothy served as examples of both. So Paul could say he became all things to all people to win all people, correct? All right. Now, Paul left Titus in a place called Dalmatia in southern Crete to establish the church there, just like he did Timothy, leaving Timothy in Ephesus. So this is in Crete, because we're going to hear a comment about Cretans in a short while. Verse 1, Timothy, I mean Titus 1. Paul, a bondservant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the, the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness. As usual, Paul opens up a verse that's loaded with theological implications. First, he says, I am of the lowest status you know of when it comes to God. I am a bondservant. Okay, I'm a bondservant to God. I serve him. I wake up in the morning looking to do what he wants me to do until I go to sleep at night just so I can rest enough to get up in the morning to do what he would have me to do. One of the greatest compliments given in scripture by God to somebody was when in the eulogy God gave about Moses to Joshua. And he simply said this, Moses, my servant, is dead. So of all the things he could have called Moses, who's considered one of the greatest Jews that ever lived, the greatest thing God could say to him is he was my servant. Okay? We see that as a lowly title, but when, when the servanthood is towards God, it becomes the loftiest of titles. So he says, I am a bondservant of God, and then he says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. 
Now he gives himself the highest of titles, higher than pastor, bishop, anything else that he names. He gives himself the absolute highest of titles. So think of God saying, those who humble themselves will be exalted. He saw himself as a bondservant, yet Jesus Christ called him to be an apostle. Now, it says, according to the faith, of God's elect. And you know how much we can talk about these types of terms. But this says this is according to the faith that God's elect people have. And the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness. I think that is such an important phrase for us. It's an acknowledgement of truth. And what is the truth? Not a truth. But when we embrace the truth, it accords with godliness. In other words, there is a lifestyle that naturally follows from you embracing the truth. It's a transformational truth. It doesn't leave people the same when you embrace this truth. That's why Christian after Christian after Christian can stand up and give a testimony of their relationship with Christ. <clears throat> the truth is designed by God to conform us to God's image. It's Romans 8, 29. And it's a predestination verse. You have been predestined. And then what does it say after that? To heaven, to hell? No. It says you've been predestined to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. That's what walking in a truth that accords with godliness does. There's a preset destiny for walking in that truth will conform you into the image of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus can then freely say, you will know who are mine by their fruits. There's a predetermined destiny for walking in truth that you will be more like Jesus when you do so. Okay, that's why we can't, we, we cannot accept the claim of a carnal Christian that they say, yes, I'm a Christian, yet you look at their life and there's no Christianity there. Okay, their, their actions are speaking louder than their words are speaking. Okay, because there's a truth that accords with godliness. There's a predetermined destiny for walking in truth that you'll be more like Jesus. God designed you to respond to truth in a way where you become a godly person. Verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Isn't it incredible he says more in a greeting than you and I can say like an entire email? It's really more than we can say in an entire email. And this is just him saying, hello. It's unbelievable. All right. Now, what does he say in this greeting? All right. So this truth that affords with godliness brings a hope of eternal life. And it does not mean that you might not make it to heaven if you're walking in the truth and you have to hope that you do. That is clearly Islam and other ones where you have to hope even if you're totally obedient. Okay, this is a hope that simply means the fulfillment of the promise that's given to you as a believer. You simply have to wait for it. And the Bible says you wait in hope. Okay, it's almost more like um, I think if we translated that word into 21st century American English where we can understand what hope meant, it would say in the certain anticipation of eternal life. That's what they're meaning by this hope of eternal life. Why? Because it's from God who cannot lie, he says. And he promised it before time began. So what did he promise before time began? Well, we see things in the Psalms about before time began, conversations between the Father and the Son that have to do with sacrifices aren't going to cut it. <clears throat> Jesus is going to have to take on a body. This is when he was spirit as part of the Trinity. He's going to take on a body and he's going to become the sacrifice for mankind. And we see those promises given through the Psalms. But has in due time manifested his word, which I think Paul would say the editors of my version should have capitalized W here. I think he's talking about manifested his capital W word, Jesus Christ, the word that became flesh and dwelt amongst us. In due time manifested his word through preaching. Now, we know in Romans 10, it says faith comes by hearing the word of God. If faith comes by hearing the word of God, then it's through preaching 
that this word is manifested. And then Paul said, this was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Okay, so again, this is Paul saying, hello. Christianity came into the world at a time when it was uniquely possible for its message to spread rapidly anywhere on the planet. You see, in the first century, we have a very small, several hundred year window. When you look at all the time of humanity, there's only a very small couple hundred year period where the entire world knew the same language, which was Greek. When, when Alexander the Great conquered the known world, he Hellenized it. He made everybody learn the Greek language. It's in that window of time when everybody can read and speak Greek that God sent his son into the world and told Paul and the apostles, write it down and get it out. And they could all write it in Greek and didn't matter where they went, they would be able to communicate that. So um, very advantageous time for this. There were virtually no frontiers in the first century because the vast nature of the Roman Empire. So almost everywhere they went, they would run into developed cities filled with people. So it's a perfect time for this word to be manifested through preaching. Travel was comparatively easy back then. It was slow, but it was safe because of the security that the Roman Empire brought to the roads and to the sea routes. So they had lots of, lots of availability of transportation and a lot of um, safety brought by the Roman Empire for the travel of, of the word of God getting out. And the world was largely at peace in the first century due to the Pax Romana, okay, the peace of Rome. <laughs> so it was a very advantageous time for this word to be committed through preaching, common language, good transportation, guaranteed safety on these travels. Ch uh, verse 4, to Titus, a true son in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. That is a marvelous and clearly Pauline greeting. He loves offering grace as he begins a letter, and he loves wishing grace upon his hearers when he completes a letter. Verse 5, for this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I command you. So much like Timothy in Ephesus, Paul now would have Titus to set up the church in Dalmatia, which is in southern Crete, <coughs> beginning with the appointment of qualified elders, just like he did with Tim Timothy. Now, you're going to see a lot of the same requirements of a person who's going to serve as an elder that you saw in Timothy. So what I want you to know is that seminary education does not qualify you for spiritual leadership. Being a good talker does not qualify you for spiritual leadership. Natural gifts or even certain spiritual gifts themselves do not qualify one for spiritual leadership. How much money you give to your church or the volunteer time that you give to your church does not qualify you for spiritual leadership. What qualifies a person for spiritual leadership is godly character. And that is the criteria that Paul is about to give us. He says in verse six, if a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. So there you see the same principles from 1 Timothy applying here to have it right in your own house before you try to go to God's house and get it right. Lead well with your family before you try to lead well with the broader family of God. Verse seven, for a bishop, which is a word for overseer, an overseer must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. So the steward of God, that's a word. God has given me like two words this year so far. One is stewardship. 
And I always thought stewardship was like with tithe money. You got to be a good steward, tithe money. Maybe your personal finances be a good steward. But what I realize is it's every blessing that we get. There's a stewardship requirement with that blessing. It's the idea of getting a mina. The person that got the mina and just said, I'm going to bury it, got in trouble, correct? But the person that took that mina and said, now I want to steward this into more minas, received the blessing from the Lord, right? So every gift that we get, every time we could say, thank you, God, for this, think how you could steward the thing that you're thankful for into more blessing somehow. Like how, how can somebody else or how can more people be blessed by the thing that I'm thankful for right now? Stewarding the gifts, stewarding the things that you're thankful for, seeing them as the minas that you're not to bury in the ground, but that you're to multiply and multiply. And I think that's how the world changes. Verse 8. But hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled. So hospitable means a lover of strangers. A lover of strangers. So... There's nothing about ethnicity, skin color, gender, anything like that going on that determines if you love a person or not. It, it can be a complete stranger under any of those categories. And this command to be hospitable means you're going to love them the way Christ loves them. You're hospitable. It says to be sober-minded. Your true image bearing of God only happens when you're sober-minded. As soon as you're not sober-minded, you're a compromised version of the image of God that God made you to be. You cannot think properly. You cannot react properly. You cannot represent the fact that God made you in his image and has a purpose and a plan for your life that is eternally significant to other people. You literally compromise all of that when you're not sober-minded. It allows the true image bearing of God to take place in your life. He says to be holy. That is one of the things that I think the American church is going to be held accountable for is the American church, in my opinion, in my observation, has lost that sense of holiness. We've lost our sense of holiness. And I'm just going to mention a couple things because <clears throat> I want to, I guess. Um, <laughs> It's, it's stuff like this. Um, guys, taking off your hats for prayer and worship. Sense of holiness, reverence. Um, being on church on time for worship. Okay? That you actually consider worship something that you dedicate your planning to say, I'm in my seat before the music starts. Because I'm going to worship God. I'm worshiping him. I really think people try to economize how much time they spend in church and worship goes out the door and people show up for the message. And then heaven forbid there's communion and that ruins your day, so you're out the door before communion. Okay? The sense of holiness. Uh, we got to get it back. Self-controlled. Okay, that's the other one, the other phrase that God has given me. Steward the blessings and have self-control. Just when I think about self-control, I realize... All these areas that I'm on autopilot, I'm really not in control of myself. I'm in the, a certain habits that aren't the best. And I didn't notice them until I started focusing in on self-control. Am I the decision maker of all of my words and actions? Or am I on some autopilot where maybe I say rude phrases or things like that automatically? I'm not in control of what I'm saying at that moment. It's just what I do. Well, self-control, I think that a sense of holiness and stewarding the blessings are the weaknesses that I want to look at in me and I certainly would love the body of Christ to look at in themselves. Verse 9, holding fast the faithful word that has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. This is the most important part of being a leader in a church. The church sinks without elders being able to protect doctrine, correct error, teach truth. Now, these churches that Paul is setting up always start off as house churches. And now Jewish influences are coming in 
and these Judaizers are trying to bring Moses' law back into the church. So they're, 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 they're putting legalism in the church, and Paul's saying, you've got to defend your people from thinking things like circumcision are necessary for salvation. That anything except for what Christ has done for them on the cross is necessary for their salvation. Because once they realize Christ did it all and all they have to do is believe and they walk in that truth, what's going to happen? All those laws that they're supposed to follow are going to start becoming naturally who they are and what they do. They're going to be transformed into the image of Christ who followed all 613 laws 100% perfectly. And you'll be transformed into that image not perfectly like Christ, so you still need to confess and repent, but your colors will be clear that you're a Christian. All right, verse 10, or what verse? Oh yeah, verse 10. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. Same complaints he had in Ephesus with Timmy. Timmy. You spend all that time in First and Second Timothy, he, become, he, he says, you start calling him Timmy, yeah. <laughs> all right, anyways. <laughs> wow, all right, anyways. <laughs> Same situation he had with Timothy in Ephesus. All right, now. He says, whose mouths must be stopped who subvert whole households. So you can see this idea of the house churches here. They subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. Man, I bet you you can name people who do this. With all the social media and all the preachers that are out there, you can find people who are doing what? They are teaching things they should not, and why are they doing it? For dishonest gain. Now, it doesn't necessarily, dishonest gain, you're not guilty of this just if you're making a lot of money from it. You're guilty of it if you're getting a lot of fame from it too. That's dishonest gain because your popularity is becoming as a preacher of Christ and you're really not. Your motives are wrong, okay? So it could be for money, it could be for position, it could be for selfish ambitions, anything that's not, simply trying to point people to Christ and the cross of Christ, first for the salvation of their souls and then for the edification of their walk with Christ, should be the only concern of preaching. Verse 12. One of them, okay, this is a very interesting part here. So he says, one of them, a prophet of their own. So one of them, where is he? He's in Crete. So one of them is another Cretan. And what does he say? What is he? He's quoting a creed, a creed. It's actually Epimenides, a Cretan. He's quoting, and the Cretan said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. So there is debate in scholarship of is this like double talk, or is it supposed to be understood as simply as it is? Is this Cretan saying Cretans really are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons? Or is is Epimenides, the Cretan, a liar and lying when he says Cretans are always lying, which would mean they're actually pretty honest people? You're looking for me for an answer. I don't have. But anyways, I tend to think that's overthinking it, to be honest with you. I think that Cretan was saying we Cretans are all liars, and he was telling the truth at that point in time that he always lies. And the, be, why do I think that? Because there's no getting around calling yourself an evil, evil beast and a lazy glutton. I think um, that would say he's not trying to be positive at all, correct? So that would mean they're, they're always liars as well. So, um, so notorious were the Cretans that the Greeks actually formed a verb based on the behavior of Cretans. And that Greek verb is kratzine to kratize, which means to lie and to cheat. And they had a proverbial phrase, kretzine pros kreta, which meant, which meant to kretize against a cretin, which meant 
to match lies with lies. Okay? <laughs> so none of it's good. None of it's good. All right? So as Paul just said, listen, here's what a Cretan said. Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And now Paul is going to give some pastoral testimony to that incredibly hurtful charge. And he says, this testimony is true. He agrees. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. There's a goal to the rebuke, isn't it? It's not a rebuke just to say, you're wrong, okay? Um, <laughs> I had a good example of this for my six-year-old granddaughter because um, very loose tooth, and her teacher saw how loose it was. She says, why don't you go down to the nurse and see if they can get it out for you? She went down to the nurse. The nurse said, no, it's not ready yet. She goes back upstairs, and her tooth comes out, right? She's celebrating, celebrating her tooth came out. I go and I pick her up, and she goes, let's go show the nurse and tell her she's wrong. <laughs> and I said, we're going to go show the nurse, but we're not going to tell her she was wrong. We're just going to let her celebrate with you, okay? All right. And she took the money that she got from the one tooth, and she started seeing how many teeth she had, and she's adding up what the, what the cash flow is going to be one day. She did all that. She did all that. <laughs> all right. I don't think that's dishonest gain, but I think it's just, maybe it's just ambition. I don't know. All right, so. Uh, back to 13. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. They were apparently battling against Jewish legalism, which contradicted the freedom that the cross brought them. That's known in, as, as Judaizing, trying to make Christian believers follow Jewish law again. Verse 15, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and their conscience are defiled. The all things refers to everything which is non-moral, such as an appetite for food, desire in marriage, exchange and commerce, weariness and rec recreation, and so on through all the varied realms of life. To the pure, all these things are pure, and they will be maintained in purity. To the impure, every one of them may be made a vehicle and an occasion of impurity. That comes from Dr. Morgan. Now, so you will see... Um, well, I could say I, I see when I deal with, you know, year after year of, of, of teenagers and so forth, that <clears throat> when a less than pure comment is made, you'll see pure kids go, I don't get it. Because it, to them, everything's pure and they don't understand what just happened. And meanwhile, the impure kids are laughing their heads off and even mocking the, the pure kids, right? And you see that this is a truth that plays out in scripture. To the pure, all things are pure. It's like when you're pure, you can actually give the benefit of the doubt. And you can be gracious towards people. But if you're not pure, then everything's defiled. And you take everything in in a defiled way. Verse 16. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. So professing to know God and living a life that shows you don't know God that's the carnal Christian that I'm talking about. And what does Paul say about that type of person? He says they're abominable, they're disobedient, and they're disqualified from every good work. It's really, really serious business. Now, many, many years ago, in this very study at another location, I had uh, a former student visiting in the crowd, and she was a very talented singer-dancer, and she sat in the crowd as somebody who had a job on the cruise lines performing in their Broadway-like sh shows on cruises. But unfortunately, that lifestyle of people that are at sea like that for long periods of time as performers, apparently that lifestyle is very promiscuous. They're, they very much sleep with each other and drink and party and all that stuff. So she fell into all of that. And then when she would come home, her family would make sure that she came to church, she came to my study and everything, 
And I happen to say in that study what I just said tonight, that carnal Christians are not Christians. I'm to know you by your fruit. If your fruit is rotten, then you're a rotten tree. That's not my opinion. I'm quoting Jesus Christ. And when I said something like that, it literally changed her life sitting in her chair. She quit the cruise lines. Um, she married a Christian guy. And today, her and her husband live out in Hawaii, and they are youth ministers together. And she will tell you how penetrating what I said about carnal Christianity was to her. She knew that was her. She knew she denied her Lord through her lifestyle. It penetrated her heart, and she changed her life right around. It's a marvelous story. Chapter 2. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. The older men be sober. There's that word again. Here's another great and important word, to be reverent. So we're going to talk to older men. We're going to talk to older women. We're going to talk to younger men. And you're going to see this word, teach them reverence, teach them reverence. All these categories of people Paul's saying, in your church, Titus, you have to teach them reverence. So what is that? The same thing I was talking about when I talked about holiness. It's recognizing holiness, recognizing the sacred spaces that you're in and having reverence for those sacred spaces. And the most sacred of those spaces is you if you're a believer. Who are you that you've been called the temple of the living God, the dwelling place of of El Shaddai, God Almighty. You are sacred space. This is why sin is so serious. When you came to faith in Jesus Christ, you became a temple, you became sacred space, and you need to honor that, this space of sacredness by monitoring what you're looking at, monitoring what you're listening to, to be holy as God is holy, to, to realize that it makes a big difference if you're presenting yourself to the world as sacred space that has been treated with reverence or not. It's a big difference in your effect on the world. So Paul says, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Tell the older men this, be sober, be reverent, be temperate. That came, a lot, that came up a lot in the Timmy books, right? The Timothy books, that came up a lot. Um, temperate. What is that? That's the ability to walk the middle ground between underdoing stuff and overdoing stuff, like eating. Okay, there's literally a middle ground where to walk. You can underdo eating, you can overdo eating. Both are sinful. Not many people confess that they're a glutton, but I've probably committed that sin more than any sin I've ever committed because I have been full and my body's like, stop, that's all I need. And I go, I don't want to hear from you. My mouth is still having a great time right? And I become unhealthy by doing that. That's gluttony, okay? So temperance is your ability through sexual appetites, through food appetites, that you can walk that middle ground of holiness without stepping out of those bounds. You, that, that's a, an incredible strength. It's funny how a word like being temperate sounds like you're kind of mild or meek, but man, why, why are we sinning in these areas all the time? Because it requires intentionality and strength. So we have temperance is a very hard thing to obtain. Sound in faith. If you say you believe, listen, if you have to tell people you're a believer, you're probably not living the way Jesus wants you to live. Our fruit should be so evident. Um, there's, there's a great uh, saying from, um, I think it's uh, St. Francis, I believe can't remember exactly who now. My wife loves to quote this, so. But it's um, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. Okay? Preach the gospel at all times, when necessary, use words. That's being sound in faith, in love, and in patience. I was speaking with a, with a uh, Christian minister this morning, and he said, I need you to pray for my patience. And I, I, I said to him a little bit later, that's not something you should ask people to pray for. That's something you're commanded to do, okay? This isn't like, let patience come over me. Ask God for patience to come over. No, God looks at you and commands you, be patient. Why? Because your salvation came through God's long suffering. Your salvation came through his patience, 
It's a decision you make to be patient. So if you just say, I'm an impatient person, well, here's the cure. Stop it. <laughs> okay, start, start operating in a command that's been given to you to be patient. Okay, know that your salvation came through patience. And so therefore, be thankful for that that God had that patience, and then you be that way with everybody all the time. Be patient with people, okay? Verse three, the older women likewise, that they be reverent, there it is, reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teacher of good things, verse four, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Now, <laughs> okay, how many women in this country think we got the raw end of the deal here? Okay. I am very, very sad in how confused we are over how important the household is. Satan attacks the household more than he attacks the business world. Okay? Give him your career and give him your home and ask which one he wants the most. What do you think he's going to say? The home. And we've left the home abandoned. And we've left the children alone. And we're wondering why our nation is like it is. Okay? I think the great... Okay, here it goes. I think the greatest feminist movement we could possibly have is to say what an important job it is to pay attention to the home. And I know that I know what we've said for the last 50 years, guys, I know what we've said, but I think we're in a position to see the cost. And if somebody doesn't start putting a top value on family and children, nothing's going to get better. Family and children. That children have to wait to be born before we give them the right to live is absolutely insane to me. That a woman's womb is the most dangerous place for a child to be when God said it's the safest place in the universe for you to start your life. These are sins that we cannot say we're going to be a Christian nation and still behave these ways. We can't. All right. Verse six. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded and all things showing yourself to be a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, there it is, incorruptibility. You know, people say, Everybody has their 30 pieces of silver. Like, what's your 30 pieces? What will it take for you to deny the Lord? What's your price? Okay. You know what the apostles showed us? They had no price. They had to be killed to stop talking about Jesus. Okay. So that's what incorruptibility means. It doesn't, you can be promised the entire world and you say no to it for the sake of Jesus Christ. Because your Lord said, what does it profit you if you gain the whole world and forfeit your soul? You want to know what your worth is? Jesus said it's a bad deal for you to gain the whole world if you forfeit your soul. Your soul is infinitely more valuable than this entire world's value has. So incorruptibility means you would choose death over selling out the Lord. Sound speech, verse 8, that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Think of Jesus saying, who of you can accuse me of a sin? Okay, what would have to be cleaned up for us to even attempt to say something like that? Who of you can accuse me of a sin? Verse 9, exhort bond servants. Now this is not approving of slavery. And, and I'm not going to get totally into this tonight, but the slavery he's addressing is not the slavery of America 200 years ago. This was largely people that could not pay back their debts 
the way they paid him back was serving a family. Okay, <laughs> This wasn't going to another nation, kidnapping people against their will, bringing them to your country, and then forcing them under the threat of violence to serve you. That was America. That was not Israel. Okay, So he says, and you'll, you'll, the book of Philemon unpacks that very, very well. That we'll be into in a couple weeks. <coughs> or in a week. We'll see. Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. In fact, God set it up where every seven years you had to set these bond servants free, even if their debt was not paid back. You had to set everybody free in seven years. And they had to make a provision for bond servants that didn't want to leave. <laughs> you think that was the same slavery we had in this country? No. Okay, they would have to put a bolt through their ear to show he's my bond servant and I did set him free, but he didn't want to go because he's family now. And he didn't want to go. Okay. All right, verse 11. For the grace of God, this is one of the great, great paragraphs, I think, in all of Scripture. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Now, this says, for the grace of God that brings salvation to all people has appeared to all men. It's appeared to all men. Now, this should be a Christmas teaching, but I'll, I'll, um, I'll give you a preview. This is, this is one of the greatest things I learned probably in the last year. So there's this star of Bethlehem, right? At the, at the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, there was a star of Bethlehem. And the, the grace of God that appeared to all men, we can make an argument that the grace of God that appeared to all men appeared to all men in the stars. And this is the text that points us in that direction. It's Revelation chapter 12. It says, now a great sign appeared in heaven. That's where the stars are, right? A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God in his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Does that sound like any story you know? It's the birth of Christ, correct? Herod being the dragon. Well, gosh, I just entered into something I have no time for. But anyways, um, there's a 90-minute period in history that happened on September 11th, 3 BC. Now, I know September 11th means something to us now, but... This is another September 11th in 3, 3 BC. And very, very, very briefly, here's what happened in that 90-minute period. There was a woman clothed in the sun, in the skies. The woman was the constellation Virgo, which means what? Virgin. She was clothed in the sun, which is astronomical language for saying the sun went from her neck to her knees in that constellation for a 90-minute period. She's clothed in the sun. It says the moon was at her feet in this passage. Well, for a 90-minute period on September 11, 3 BC, the sun was from the neck to the knees of the constellation Virgo, and the moon was at the feet of the constellation Virgo. Next to Virgo was the constellation Leo, 
which is the lion, which Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. In the constellation Leo, there was the planet Jupiter, which we call the king planet for obvious reasons. And there was a star called Regulus, which is what we get our word regal or royal from. And that star was in the constellation Leo. And for a 90 minute period on September 11, 3 BC, Regulus the star and Jupiter the planet were side by side so the naked eye, it was one giant, huge star in the sky. Jupiter has what they call retrograde motion, meaning it moves across the sky, it stops, and then it returns to its place. They followed this star. It said it stopped over the place the child was born, and that's where they knew where the child was. And that's when it would have been right next to Jupiter, I mean right next to Regulus, the star, Jupiter and Regulus, and that would have been your star in Bethlehem. Um, and then to the other side of Virgo was um, Cancer. Is that the one with the scorpion? So the scorpion one with the long tail, that was next to it. And this says there was a fiery red dragon with a long tail that swept a third of the scars from the sky. Well, in that same 90-minute period, that tail of um, Cancer was in a very empty area of the sky where there was like no visible stars. Okay? So that happened in a 90-minute period and. 3 BC, you figure out if that's the... Remember, God said, ask a sign as high as heaven to Isaiah. And he says, that's when a, a virgin will have a child. Such a coincidence, all this stuff. Yes. Anyways, that's pretty cool. All right, so what does this say? For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men... And you could argue that it appeared in the stars to, for them, to all men. All right, so he finishes with, speak these things, exhort, rebuke with all authority, let no one despise you. Chapter three, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities. And I love that Paul says that when Caesar is his authority and will also be his executioner, Okay to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one. You know Paul did not have social media then, right? To speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, to be gentle, showing all humility to all men. All these things have been covered by Paul. So he asked Titus to give reminders of these things. 2 Peter 1.12 Peter says, it's good for me to remind you of these things. Okay, we, we're, we're given communion as a reminder of things that happen, correct? Of the death of Christ. We need reminders, reminders, reminders. And again, I'm going to bring up stained glass windows. Stained glass windows are a reminder that you're going to a jeweled city, a beautiful jeweled city. Okay, we need reminders. Okay. So he says, remind them, be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, sowing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the, so listen, he says, here's why you're not to do these bad things to people, because you were that person before. And God's loving kindness and patience drew you to him and saved you from all of that. So if you got pulled out of that, don't go turning around looking back at, at those who are still there and treat them as outcasts. He says, we were also them. Verse four, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's called cliff notes of the book of Romans. There's so much there. So what do we have there? Well, <coughs> he says, Listen, be subject to your rulers and authorities, like he says in Romans 13. Obey, be ready for every good work. A good work presents itself to you. Be ready for that good work. Perform that good work. 
Speak evil of no one. Be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility. Remember, you were once them. And now you're not. And if you want them to not be them, but to be more like you as you follow Christ, then don't neglect them. Why? Because when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared to man, it wasn't by your works of righteousness that he appeared to you. But it was according to his mercy, the washing of regeneration. That word generation, that's from the Greek ganao, to beget or to give birth to. You're generated. That's why you have generations as your genealogy. This says regeneration, mean be born again. Okay, you experienced being born again. You were regenerated. You were renewed. When you were born into this world, you were new. Now you're made new again. That's why Jesus say, I make all things new. If it touches Jesus' hands, he's going to make it new. Renewing of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Okay, so he's saying, listen, if you understood that, could you possibly mistreat people who are just like you used to be? When you understood that it was his grace that changed you and saved you, now God wants you to be a part of the regenerating of others. Verse 8, this is a faithful saying. He had two of those in Timothy, and now he has one of these faithful sayings here in Titus. He says, this is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly. What is so important that he says that? That those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. <laughs> so now, he says, listen, here's a faithful saying. If you believe in God, make sure you're doing good things, okay? So as Paul will say in Ephesians, you've been saved by grace through faith alone, not of works, so that nobody can boast, but you are uh, God's workmanship, that he, what you were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So you weren't saved by those works, but you were created to do them. You're not saved by them, you're created to do them. James 2, that everybody says contradicts that, does not contradict that. It literally unpacks that very detailed. It'll talk about Rahab and Abraham, the things they did justified not them towards regeneration. It justified the fact that they claimed to be saved. Abraham says, I'm saved. And somebody says, how do I know you're saved, Abraham? He'll say, I brought my son up on a mountain to sacrifice him because God told me to. And so James is saying that work justified his claim for faith. It didn't justify his soul. It justified his claim for faith. Rahab justified her claim to faith by hiding the spies. The hiding the spies did not regenerate her and save her. But what's the outward actions of a truly saved person? They say, look at Abraham's actions. Look at Rahab's actions. That's justifying their claims of faith. So Paul says, here's a faithful saying. If you believe, then be careful to maintain good works because that's the outward evidence of the inward authenticity of your salvation. And he says, these things are good and profitable to men, but avoid foolish disputes and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law for they are unprofitable and they're useless. That should be in the mission statement of every social media company. Let them say that and see how popular they become. Reject the divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped in sinning, being self-condemned. Social media should limit you to two rebukes of somebody, and after that, they should put up a sign saying, you're a warped and sinning person. You receive two rebukes and you're not stopping, you're warped and sinning, rather than you can scroll and scroll and scroll through all the fighting that goes on, correct? As a Christian, you're told to avoid that. Verse 12, when I send Artemis to you or Tychicus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, for I decided to spend the winter there. Send Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their journey with haste that they may lack nothing. And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. All who are with me greet you, greet those who love us in the faith. And what does Paul always wish people as he closes out the letter? Grace. 
Grace be with you all. Amen. Now, as he says here, he, he names Artemis, Tychicus. He names um, Zenus. He names Apollos. He, and he talks about their assistance and their help. And it just reminds me of this. A good name is better than, than, than many riches. They say fine ointment, but to them that was riches. Okay? There you get people's good name. And um, as we dealt with the death of a precious girl in our student body, um, we've had at 11th and grade, 12th grade chapel, we had 20 kids come forward motivated by Sailor's life to get saved. At the 9th and 10th grade chapel, we had about 25 come forward to get saved. At the middle school chapel, 50, is that a fair number to say? 50 kids came forward to get saved, give their life to the Lord. So we've had... 80 to 100 kids come forward and get saved based on Selah's life and testimony. And guess what? All we did was talk about how good her name was for 15 years. Her good name is better than many riches. Why? It's leading to life for other people time and time and time again. And as Pastor Doug did the Saturday service in the sanctuary, he compared her life to the First Corinthians 15 seed that once it's buried in the ground, produces great harvest. And so all of these kids uh, that are coming forward, and I'm, we're about to do our third straight weekend of just baptizing CCA kids that keep requesting baptisms. Um, and we call all these kids uh, Selah's Harvest because she's the seed that went into the ground that's producing uh, this harvest right now. Yeah, so it's tremendous. Yeah, absolutely. And... To see this family receive strength from Christ, uh, this dad did all three of these chapels with me, telling his story, and he's done all these baptisms with me, and he rejoices. Um, when, when these middle school kids came out of their seats to come forward, you could see him get overwhelmed with emotion and just choke up because he cost him a lot for these kids to get the message that are bringing them forward. It cost him dearly. And so for him to see that God is using that and for him to maintain faithfulness without blinking through this great tragedy has made us all better that have, have witnessed this. So um, it's a good name. Good name means a lot. I'll never forget one senior that when she came forward crying, she just says, I just want to have a good name like she had. And so it shouldn't take something like that to motivate us like that. Okay, we should be motivated because it simply says in here that your good name is important. So tomorrow you're going to get up out of bed and everything you say and do is going to be credited to your name. So I want to encourage you to make that name good for Christ's sake. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of our Lord Jesus, Lord. And we just got fed so much, Lord. And I looked through this text the last couple of days and been reading it and reading it and taught it. And Lord, I just feel like I heard it for the first time and it fed me all over again. And so grateful to you, Lord. And may your word forever go out in the mouths of each and every person in this room more and more abundantly all the time. For it is the best things that we could possibly be saying to people. It's the only thing that has life and light in them. So may we be faithful to your word, Lord, today and forevermore in increasing measure for your great name's sake. We pray all these things. Amen.